Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, right now we're enjoying the live feed from the International Space Station. You can see the date and the time right down there in the stamp and you can see the location of the space station just to the southwest of Texas. Now, in a day where we can at will log on to these live feeds, it amazes me that people, for some reason, doubt this oblate spheroid shape of our planet. Yet they do. Why is that? Well, today I found a video from a prominent person in that science denying community by the name of Nathan Oakley. So let's cue up the music and listen to Nathan Oakley explain to us scientifically why space is fake. Now, Nathan Oakley was responding to this radio talk show by another flat earther, and he follows it up with an explanation of why space is fake scientifically. So let's have a listen. When you suggest that you have space, therefore second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply, it's a begging the question fallacy. So often I will ask fundamentalist religious zealots, Beyond your fundamentalist religious zealot belief that the sky is a vacuum, how can you have gas pressure without a container? Because the natural instinct of a fundamentalist globe-believing fundy, it's a bit redundant, <laughs> is to beg the question of the sky vacuum and then tell us that obviously the second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply because the gas isn't filling my presupposition that the sky is a vacuum. Now, I love it when flat earthers put up the second law of thermodynamics argument because this is something that they borrowed whole cloth from the scientific creationists of the 1980s. And it was debunked back then, and we can debunk it again using the exact same logic. Now, the original argument was that evolution could not have occurred because to take random objects and create them into something complex like life would be a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, which states that things go from complexity to randomness and increase in entropy. However, like the creationists, the flat earthers don't apply the law correctly. And that is the second law of thermodynamics discusses a closed system at thermodynamic equilibrium. So, if you introduce gas into a closed container that has a vacuum, that gas will disperse to fill all of the available space and equalize the pressure throughout the container. Now, even a very basic understanding of our atmosphere reveals that we have not equalized our pressure to fill all of the available space of a container. That's because there is no container around the Earth. We don't live under a dome with a fixed volume. We live on the surface of a sphere. Now, we also don't live in a closed thermodynamic system. If we had an isolated system or a closed system with no forces acting upon it, our atmosphere would be the same temperature and it would be the same pressure from top to bottom. However, that doesn't occur. We have energy and heat coming into the system in the form of energy from the sun. We also have gravity, an outside force, acting upon the mass of the atmosphere. And that's why we have a pressure gradient. So, he accuses us of presupposing things. We can measure the light from the sun, the energy from the sun, and gravity. No problem. What he's presupposing is that the Earth is covered with a dome, or is in an enclosed space. Now, the mass of the atmosphere is attracted to the center of the Earth by gravity, just like all other masses on Earth are. And as a result, you have movement in the direction of an applied force. And that is the definition of work. So what they're not including in their understanding of the second law is the effect of work on the system and whether it's an open or a closed or an isolated system. So far, they've gotten it all wrong. They're attempting to apply the mechanics of a closed system in thermodynamic equilibrium 
to our dynamic open system atmosphere. So let's continue. Well, that's a begging the question fallacy. To assume that you've got a sky vacuum and therefore not require a justification for its violation of that particular law, that would be an entropy increase or standard gas law. The volume that you would calculate it with would be the volume of space the gas has to fill. Now, once again, if Mr. Oakley had actually taken the science, technology, engineering, and math to have been an astronaut, he would understand that what he's doing is trying to apply the second law of thermodynamics to an open system with outside forces acting upon it. But he can't explain why there's a pressure gradient within our atmosphere, which is also a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. He also doesn't explain how Mars, where we have a rover right now, is a spherical planet that rotates and has an atmosphere without a container. But let's see how he addresses that. That's what gas does. It expands in all directions. So the gas we're breathing, which would be an availability of volume for the gas we breathe to fill. And fill it, it must. That's what gas does. It expands in all directions. So the gas we're breathing, which is at pressure, would fill the sky vacuum. Now, their response is often to say, well, we have a gas pressure gradient, which is merely a delta of the original question and assertion when you've got a sky vacuum belief. How can you have gas pressure in the first instance without a container? And they would say, well, a delta of gas pressure, gas pressure gradient is something we experience. It's like, well, how did you achieve the gas pressure in the first place? Now, the thing that you have to ask yourself is, where did this unusual technique come from? What Oakley is trying to do is he's trying to put us on the spot to switch the burden of proof over to us. Well, if you have a atmospheric pressure gradient, how did you get gas pressure in the first place? First of all, tell me how that's relevant. Second of all, tell me that we did have a uniform gas pressure first, and then it went into a gradient. How about the fact that we had gas generated at the surface of the proto-Earth, which was a large mass with gravity? It started off in a pressure gradient. There never was a time it was at a uniform pressure from top to bottom of the initial atmosphere. This is akin to trying to say gravity doesn't exist because we can't precisely define how gravity occurs. We can describe the effects of it, but we can't describe the exact cause of it. And therefore, somehow, gravity must not be real. Yet, there it is. Without the container, there can be no pressure. Therefore, if the sky was a vacuum, as asserted in the heliocentric rhetoric, then the gas we breathe would fill the space. Outer space, claimed to be a vacuum, is fake. Therefore, any claims from that claim to be sky vacuum are automatically fake. Now, in case you really wondered why he was trying to make this absurd claim that outer space is fake, here is the reason. Because remember, his goal is to promote a flat earth narrative. His goal is not to look for truth. It's not to evaluate evidence. It's not to learn something. He has a narrative and a movement that he wants to promote and recruit members for. So the way he does it is he's abusive to his guests. He doesn't listen to evidence with his little mute button. And now he's trying to make this silly second law of thermodynamics argument. Now, let's see why he's doing that. Have a listen. Outer space, claimed to be a vacuum, is fake. Therefore, any claims from that claim to be sky vacuum are automatically fake, including but not limited to pictures of Earth from space. The region is fake, second law of thermodynamics violation. Therefore, the pictures claimed to have come from the fake region are also fake. Orbits in a sky vacuum, which is also a begging the question fallacy, which I won't detail now, is claimed to take place in a fake place called space, therefore automatically fake. Same goes for satellites, all debunked 
by the second law of thermodynamics and several other laws of nature, descriptions of how things occur always, standard gas law, Boyle's law, Avogadro's law, these are all violated by the assertion that we have a sky vacuum. We don't. And any stage performance that comes from that region is also fake, including the ISS taking place on a stage, on Earth, on high wire, not in a second law of thermodynamics violation sky vacuum. So there you have it, folks. Space has to be fake. Because unless space is fake, we have to actually seriously address the fact that we have photographs of the round spherical Earth from space. We have objects in orbit around the Earth in space. We have weather satellites taking pictures of real-time weather every couple of minutes from space. All of these confirm that the Earth is indeed not flat. So the only way to counter these things, because you really can't, is you have to deny that they're real in the first place. These images from Mars, Canada with a red tent. Astronauts in space, weightless, they're on wires. It's all CGI. It's the denial of this evidence is the only thing that they have to try and maintain their narrative. They don't really have the ability to dispute the fact that I can predict to the minute what time the ISS is going to go over my house, go out in my backyard, and there it goes, right over the house. I have photographs of satellites, geostationary satellites, in orbit, 40,000 miles away. Objects the size of a Hugo. Yet I can find them with my telescope because I know exactly what orbit they're in and I know exactly where to look and I can track them. So that's the entire argument behind the flat earth. Deny evidence by saying it's impossible to have that evidence. What in reality is happening is it's not that the evidence is fake. Your understanding of the second law of thermodynamics is flawed. And quite frankly, that's on you. So. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. We'll have further episodes like this in the future. So until then, make sure you hit that like and subscribe to my new channel. Take care and stay healthy, folks. Bye.